I learned that it was incredibly drying. And I think that that's part of why I avoided it for a long time. But I don't find in cooking with it that it has that ridiculous potency. You, you know, in tincture, yes. But in culinary form, I, I think it's lovely. Hello, and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. Well, if I were to sum up Maya in one word, it would be impressive. And that's because I'm always impressed with her, whether it's when I'm reading her fabulous books or having conversations like these. And this was a really fun interview for me as Maya touched on many themes that are important in my own life, like nature connection, working with medicinal plants daily as food and simply as a part of life, as well as interesting backstories on what her book writing process has been like. For those of you who don't already know her, Maya Toll is the award-winning author of Letting Magic In, The Night School, and The Wild Wisdom series. After pursuing an undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan and a master's at New York University, Maya apprenticed with a traditional healer in Ireland, where she spent extensive time studying the growing cycles of plants, the alchemy of medicine making, and the psycho-spiritual aspects of healing. She is the co-owner of the retail store, Herbiary, with locations in Asheville, North Carolina, and Philadelphia. Keep up with Maya's writing on her substack, Unkempt, and find her online at mayatoll.com. Well, welcome back to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, Maya. I am so glad to be back with you, Rosalie. Oh, likewise. I'm really looking forward to catching up because it's been a while. You were on all the way back in season two talking about time. Now you're here talking about another favorite culinary herb, which I'm excited to get into, but... We have some other stuff first, and yeah, I'm excited to have you back on because it's been a while, and you know, usually in the podcast, this is where I ask you about what's your journey and how has the plants brought you to us today, and you've shared that with us in the season two, which I highly recommend everybody give a listen to about time, but also just this year, a few months ago, you published your memoirs, Letting Magic In. So I'd like to start there with your memoirs and even maybe start preemptively of what does magic mean to you, Maya? Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. I started recently a little back and forth with um, a writer in England and we both have sub stacks. So um, we're doing this kind of like exchange where we're talking about magic and she is a photographer and she does like a lot of uh, photographs that are like deep fog, you know, like things emerging from the mist. And for her, you know, magic is this, like this edge of mystery, this liminal space. Um, and so it's been really interesting having this, this back and forth because I've been using this word for, oh, I don't know, a dozen years without ever super clearly defining it, you know? Like I just was like, okay, I need a word for this feeling that life is kind of enchanted and that we have connections beyond ourselves, that we're not just kind of like solo in our human body and, and can't um, touch outside of ourselves. And so I started using the word magic and it wasn't well thought out, perhaps, you know, like I actually, I was on a radio show um, when the, when the memoir came out and the woman went like riffing off on this whole thing about the magic shop down the street from her. And I finally realized that she was talking about like card tricks and, 
and I was like, I was like, okay, hold on a sec. That's not what I mean by magic. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I go back over and over again to a quote from, from Ian Forster, um, who probably like most famously for people who don't read his books, but see movies, a room with a view is, is something that, that he wrote. But, um, my favorite book by him is called Howard's End. And the epigraph in the beginning of the book is only connect. And I read this when I was 16, you know, in, in lit class in high school. And that idea of connection and how do we connect, how do we find connection um, has really been a driving force in my life. And I would say, like, particularly with my work with the plants, you know, it's how do we find connection first, like, human to plant, but then how do I, as a human, introduce this plant to another human? Like, how do I kind of pass that connection along, pass that thread along? And so for me, magic has, has to do with this idea of connection. I feel like once we can quiet the human voices in our lives, once we can quiet our own humanity and, and need to be a part of human culture, and start listening to the world around us. It's it's so rich and so vibrant, and there are ways of connecting with it. And once you connect with it, you first of all you feel differently in an, in yourself, but you also begin to be able to sense larger patterns. You know, because you're kind of plugged in. It's like you have your finger in the socket. And to me, that's that's magic. You know, and so when we have these little moments that like, I think we commonly label magical, like there's this kind of, I'm starting to see with this conversation I'm having with this uh, other writer that like the people who are doing kind of like the slow living and the paying attention to the world around you, like that's one end of this kind of magical continuum, right? Because that's the beginning of noticing the the weft and the weave of what's going on in the world around you. And then the more you pay attention and the more you kind of step into the flow and feel how things are moving and then move them intentionally, right? Um, which is what plant medicine is. You're taking the energy of a plant and you're moving it intentionally into a person. Um, then we begin to participate in the magic that like already exists in the world. We're, mm. we're part of the weaving. That's the best I can do today. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> and that's um, so many themes that you've just brought up are such big themes in my life right now. So I'm just kind of, my mind's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. All these areas lighting up. Um, one thing it makes me think about is how in the past several years, I've began intentionally walking. And so there's this different experience of going on a walk and thinking about a to-do list or thinking about steps or <laughs> thinking about heart rates or whatever. And this different experience of going on a walk and hearing the squirrel alarm call, you know, somebody in the forest, um, visiting a favorite tree that I visit all the time, noticing you know, the different scents in the air, like right now, Ceanothus is this incredible scent that's permeating the air, noticing the mushrooms that are popping up. This is just a very, like those experiences become magical, being sent, you know, really in tune with the senses, slower, really noticing the world, and also feeling a part of the world, right? Like you said, it's not, it's participating. It's not just being an observer, but being able to participate in all of that in whatever way, shape, and form, which for me is often nibbling on some rose hips along the way or um, or the elderberries that are ripe right now, et cetera. So and it's just a different experience. Do I always go out and like never think about, you know, my heart rate and the pace I'm going and, and that sort of thing and the to-do list? No, like sometimes there are just those days, but I would say those other days are the magical days and those are the days that deeply resonate. So that's something that makes me think about, but it also makes me think about my steps as an herbalist. I luckily had that kind of magical inroad when I first started, but I also had more of a, um, you know, there, there's that exciting time as an herbalist where you're like, oh my gosh, herbs can do that. And <laughs> it's so exciting. Like even the simplest things like, oh, ginger can help with my nausea. And then it becomes this almost this like 
let's figure out all of these things that herbs can do. And I think it's very easy if we aren't intentional that we can get stuck in herbs as pharmacy and mm -hmm. herbs for XYZ, which is interesting. I don't want to poo poo it, right? It's interesting. It's, you know, one way that people are grabbed into herbs, but it's this intentionality and connection that you're speaking to that brings the magic there. Yeah. I mean, it, it changes everything. First of all, I have to tell you this because this was like just such an incredible magical moment for me. And I don't know if you've had this experience, so I want to point it out to you in case you have an opportunity. So I moved, um, into the woods. I'm in the Blue Ridge Mountains and I'm on 25 acres. So like we have some protected space and we have a lot of black cohosh. So I was out walking around the garden the other day and I was smelling something that smelled like jasmine. And I was like, I don't have any jasmine. Like I was kind of like, what is that smell? And I followed my nose around. And I was like, oh my goodness, there is some autumn black cohosh scent that is like jasmine. Interesting. I've never, I've never, I mean, I've never been around this much black cohosh. I've never had this opportunity before. Hmm. Um, so I just have to point that out in case anyone else has an opportunity to be around a lot of black cohosh. Um, in the, in the autumn, I've never, I haven't smelled it at any other time of year. It hmm. was very strange and huh. very wonderful. Um, I, I have a different experience with black cohosh, not with autumn scented and not in its native habitat, but I planted black cohosh um, by my doorway, like right on the steps leading up to the porch. And the flowers, when they bloom in the summertime, smell like rotten death. And <laughs> I did not know that about black cohosh. And it took me quite a while to figure it out. I would just walk by, you know, and there's lots of plants around. So I'd walk by and it just didn't even occur to me that a plant would smell like that. I was like, what is going on? Is there a dead mouse around? Yeah. Like there's something wrong here. And after a while I figured out, oh, it's the black cohosh. And I've had like so many people come by and this is not going to make me sound like a very kind person, but maybe a <laughs> cheeky person um, <laughs> loves to see people react to things. But I invite people to smell that like, aren't these beautiful? They're called fairy wands. Give it a smell. <laughs> It's just, you know, my dad would say cheap entertainment. Um, yeah, and it's, I'm not the only one who thinks it smells like death. But, you know, again, this is not its natural habitat and it's in the summer. So now I'm curious because jasmine is one of my favorite scents. And I promise you that is not the smell coming off of my black cohosh in the summer. Okay, this is kind of fascinating because um, have you ever smelled magnolia, like when it's at the end of its bloom? Because it will start to smell rotten. Hmm. Like you'll start to smell kind of like an undercurrent of death. Hmm. Um, I'm, I, yeah, I'm wondering if we're like talking about the range of the same scent. Uh -huh. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, we need, we need other people to chime in on this. So yeah, people... we, we need, like, <laughs> we okay, need if you're out there and you have there. black cohosh, we need you to let us know. In what stage, uh, where was it located? We need specifics here. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Okay. Yeah. So, but the, you know what? This is to me like the joy of, of herbalism. Like mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time, I studied with David Winston. So trust me, I spent a lot of time memorizing, you know, chemical constituents and this does this and this does that. And, you know, uh, TCM and Ayurvedic and Native American properties. Like I've done all of that. Um, your brain can get very full, very fast, but it's, you know, it's these moments of just encountering the plant and smelling Jasmine or smelling death. And, you know, <laughs> that, that to me are so fascinating. Like, I, I love thinking about this, you know, what's it like, what's it telling you with its death scent? Mm -hmm. You know, what's it, what's it saying with its Jasmine scent? Like, they're they're living beings and they communicate by by scent by touch by like d they communicate in different ways than we do and so all of this is is information like mm -hmm. I, i'd be so curious how the medicine would be different mm -hmm. you know and how the 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 kind of the subtle energetic layers of the medicine would change 
depending on what scent profile it's in. Mm -hmm. I definitely think the difference between jasmine and rotten death is not so subtle. So that would be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the thing is like, I'm here, here I'm using the word energetics and making it sound like magic, right? But if you think about it, there's a chemical reason why it's going to smell one way or smell the other. It has mm -hmm. to do with the soil. It has to do with time of year. It has to do with how much water it has to do with nutrients. Um, so it will have a different chemical profile if it has a different scent. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, and I love that when herbalists get together, I remember many years ago watching an argument between two herbalists from different parts of the country of whether or not a plant was astringent and to what degree until it was finally like over time, this was resolved by understanding like, oh, the plant in one location is very astringent. Whereas in this other location, it is not. Yeah. And I love that plants cannot be standardized no matter how hard humans try to do so. And that it really comes back to that connection and knowing the actual plants that you're working with, not even just in a general generic sense, but literally the plants that you're working with, tasting yeah. them, smelling them. Sharing the landscape with them, mm -hmm. you know, which is, it's like, to me, like that's such an interesting piece of this. Um, we're going to get to my to my herb towards you know the end of the podcast. But the reason that I chose sage is because we have voles. We have horrible voles, mm -hmm. and I have planted the garden twice, and they've dug up everything. And so I finally researched, and they don't like sage, and they don't like alliums. So I now have a garden full of sage and alliums. Ooh, um, sounds right? delicious. <laughs> <laughs> But it's like, it's just such a very different garden than I would have planted um, given my druthers. Mm -hmm. But it's teaching me so much about this particular place and, and what can survive here, like what mm -hmm. can survive the, the wildlife here. And, um, and I think that that's such an interesting piece of the puzzle. You know, we go mm -hmm. straight to the medicine making, uh, but some of the medicine is in the understanding of, of place and of interaction and of connection. Mm -hmm. So true, Maya. Well, let's go back to your memoir a bit. It's letting magic in. We've talked about what magic may mean, not card tricks, and <laughs> more about this connection and participation. And so why a memoir? And I also guess I just want to say, like, you are such a prolific writer and you're such a beautiful writer. Your prose is just so stunning. And um, and I know that your book has received very high praise for the writing in general, but also for the journey that you take us all on. So I, just, I want to hear from you about it all. Yeah. So this is the book I've been trying to write since 2016. Um my first book, The Illustrated Herbiary, started as um, little like chapter headers as I was trying to write this memoir. Huh. And I realized way back in 2016 that I, I didn't have the chops yet. Like I didn't have the writing skill to, to pull this off. And when I was workshopping uh, the pages, people kept being like, yeah, we're not so sure about this story, but those little herb descriptions are amazing. <laughs> so I, I yanked those out. And actually, in like in my publishing contract for the Illustrated Herbiary, um, I have explicit permission to reuse them in a memoir, <laughs> which I didn't end up doing. I, you know, I went for a slightly different format, but I was so concerned that I was gonna like use use them up on the first book and and you know, wish that I had them later, um, that I had that written into the contract. So um you know, the first the first book came from the first attempts to write this story um, before I was an herbalist, before I even knew that an herbalist was a thing that a person could be or that a person could want to be. Um, I was a writer. I started writing when I was like eight or nine. I was, I was actually, so I found out late in life, like when I was in grad school, that I am severely learning disabled. And so I started reading super, super late. I actually think I started reading when I was eight or nine, um, like way later than most kids start reading. And I started reading because um, a camp counselor started 
a book with us, with my, with my camp cabin. And um, she didn't finish it by the end of the summer. And I had to know what happened. And so this book was called Terran Wanderer. It's by a guy named Lloyd Alexander. And he wrote on a, you know, a pretty typical hero's journey arc. So a hero's journey is like most of, most of your movies are hero's journeys. You know, you have your person, they're bumbling about, their life's not so great. Something happens that we, we call the call to adventure, you know, where they have to kind of step up and be a better dad or take a job in a different place or save the, the maiden from the dragon, whatever it is. <laughs> um, you know, the protagonist has to step up and do something different than they were doing before. And then they have a series of trials and tribulations that um, eventually um, end with them you know, getting it together and um, saving the princess, being a better dad, whatever the thing is. So anyway, this this story format was ingrained in my being from a very young age. And I kept trying to write stories, but I, I just didn't seem to have like a story in me. And so I spent most of my younger days trying to write stories and like they kind of went nowhere like I'd describe a character but they never did anything I didn't have that like arc and so um after my Ireland adventure I was like oh my goodness this is a hero's journey arc like I just lived through a hero's journey arc I now I now know what this thing is like I did it I can I can write it um so it was like the story I was waiting for you know I'd been saying all my life I am I am a and a writer without a story. And all of a sudden I had a story. Um, so I, I knew that I wanted to write this book kind of personally for myself because this was always a goal. But beyond that, the other thing that I had realized was that um, there weren't very many good stories out there for people who were spiritually seeking, for people who were trying to kind of step out of like the known ways of doing life and do it differently. Um, these weren't stories I could find when I was going through this process and and wanting some some guideposts, wanting like someone to trailblaze for me. So. I really wanted to write something that allowed other people to um, have a sense of breadcrumbs, you know, like your journey is not going to be the same as my journey, but here are some trail markers so that you can find your way. And it was very important to me to find a way to do this that was inclusive, that allowed people to look at my journey as um, an example, but still be able to see their journey kind of running parallel to mine and understand how their journey and my journey spoke to each other. So it was, um, it took a bit of craft. It took a bit of writing craft that, you know, I, I had to develop over six or seven years uh, to be able to feel like I could share this story in a way that was useful to other people. I didn't just want to write something for myself. I wanted to write something that, you know, really gave the reader something that that they might need in their life. Hmm. Yeah. And this book is loved by herbalists and non-herbalists alike. And is like you said, um, I saw a lot of people remarking on how it gave them those breadcrumbs as they're on their own spiritual journey of looking for that magic. Yeah. 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 I think that we all have like something we're questing toward in life. And, you know, some people are, are like looking for how you connect with family. Other people are trying to figure out how you find purpose. Um, you know, we all have something that's like at the core of our being and we're, we're trying to answer that question for ourselves, you know? And I, I think for me, uh, my question was kind of like, uh, what's my purpose? And it was like, that was mixed in with like a God question. Like, why the heck are we here? What does this all mean? And I found that stepping into a more nature-based way of living 
melded both both of these things. Like it gave me a sense of peace within to start living um, by more natural rhythms, to start interacting with the natural world as like a member of the community instead of this kind of like power over thing that humans have with nature. Mm -hmm. Um, It it calmed something in me Mm -hmm. and allowed me to feel like, you know, my actions had some meaning and some purpose and that I was part of something larger than myself. I love that. That has definitely been my, I have a very similar path and uh, yeah, and I'm so grateful for it too. And (laughs) grateful that you're sharing that and with those breadcrumbs and however ways, like you said, people might be finding their path in different ways, but it, it helps to see the trail, the different trails that have been led before us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Letting Magic In is available wherever books are sold. And congrats on another book. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. And let's talk about sage. This is a lovely aromatic plant. So we have kind of (laughs) heard why you chose sage. You apparently are having lots of sage in your life right now. I have so much sage in my life. And it's, you know, it's interesting because like, I feel like we all have plants that we really resonate with and work with a lot. And sage was not that plant for me in a culinary sage, I should say. So um, I developed a relationship like kind of unexpectedly with, with white sage. Um, It's one of my greatest plant teachers. And, you know, like I, I share the concerns that are out there about the wild harvesting and how that impacts, like not only the plant, but Um, people who are indigenous to America and and their practices. Um, I also truly believe that like when a plant decides that you are its disciple, uh, you say thank you and you listen. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you're a person who has a relationship with white sage and, and feels like guilty about it, like what, what I do is I actually, I tried to grow it here and it was miserable. It does not want to be in a rainforest. Uh, but there is uh, an organic farm that I buy from. So it's farmed. It's not wildcrafted. Um, out West, my store herbiary carries it. So like, you know, I feel like I am supporting an organic grower, which always feels good and, and buying in a way that's um, sustainable. Mm-hmm. Um, but I started, you know, working with, with white sage because it started whispering to me and it's a really, it's a really interesting plant. It has for me, I like, I realized that, that there's a masculine energy that's often associated with it, but for me, it, it kind of has grandma energy. Mm-hmm. And I find that when, um, I'm burning it and, you know, working around a person, um, the plant tends to spiral at a place where like something needs attention. And so then if I can just like point that out to the person, like, Hey, what's going on with your right shoulder? And, you know, it's gotten even more subtle than that. Like sometimes it swirls counterclockwise or clockwise. And I'm like, I, there's all these little like different different ways that it that that sm- the smoke talks to me um but it allows me to kind of get into dialogue with with the human right back to that idea of connecting mm-hmm. be like hey what what's going on there what's you know and once you start the conversation then the person is able to pull up and out like we talk about sage being used for clearing like they're able to to be, to unravel something that was stuck in their body. And so I've, I found that to be a, an amazing experience. And um, I have not had that experience. I've dried culinary stage and, and tried to, you know, use it the same way and have not had the same experience. Um, but kind of backwards, because I think most people work with culinary stage first. I, I started working with other members of the the family because I had the relationship with white sage and because all of a sudden I had sage everywhere. <laughs> um, like 
like no kidding, I have a ridiculous amount of sage. I was introduced to the the culinary sage when I was learning herbs, but it wasn't something that I deeply connected with. So now that it's all over my property, I'm kind of learning to work with it. And um, it's it's drying, which is actually great in this rainforest where I'm always damp. So, you know, that that drying quality is wonderful and cooling. Um, and for me, what like what I've really enjoyed doing is trying to figure out how to use it more as a culinary than as a medicinal because like I live in a rainforest. I'm always damp. So that drying is is something that like I want all the time. So yeah, I, you know, I'm interested in kind of like the daily use as opposed to the medicinal dose. Mm -hmm. um, so I started just playing with it and seeing what could be done. And I found a recipe at one point for fried sage, which like it's fried y'all. I am aware we are <laughs> frying, but it is ridiculously good. So the trick with this is you want dry leaves. Like if it rained the night before, you're going to end up with like a soggy fry, which is gross. Um, you really want the leaves to be dry. So um, get yourself a handful of very dry leaves and then you can use butter or oil and you're, you're frying them. Same way you would with like a bacon or something like that. Put them on a paper towel afterwards and soak off all the extra oil and they'll crisp up as they kind of like dry on the towel. And then it's such a great topping for, for eggs, for like a squash soup. You know, you just crumble it up. It's also, they're beautiful when you get like whole leaves and fry them and then, you know, blot them on the paper towel. So like Thanksgiving dinner, um, butternut squash soup, whole leaves like floating on the top, and some decorative design. They look wonderful. Um, so obviously not a daily thing, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, the fried sage is, is, like a wonderful little treat. I, I, I eat them kind of like potato chips, I have to. <laughs> I love this recipe. It's one that I've made several times. And uh, I fry mine in coconut oil. And I love them with cheese, you know, with like a soft cheese. Mm -hmm. It's just kind mm -hmm. of a nice, you know, nice digestive herb with some cheese. But definitely that squash soup garnish sounds really beautiful. Yeah, it's really good. Thank you so much, Maya, for sharing this recipe with us. And for the listeners, if you'd like to download your free crispy fried sage recipe that's beautifully illustrated by Tatiana, then visit the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com. I have noticed for myself that, you know, I, I went through a period a dozen years where I was working as a clinical herbalist. Like it was what I was doing all day, every day. and I was treating the herbs um, pretty much solely as medicine. Mm -hmm. I was using them in tincture form and, you know, formulating. And it was, it was very um, technical and kind of removed. Since I've moved more towards like being an author, that's my daily life. I, I don't see clients anymore. I've really tried to figure out how I can interact with the plants on a daily basis in just like a more gentle, companionable kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so I really love this, you know, ability to just run outside, grab a handful of something, bring it into the kitchen and use it in my cooking, um, use it in my tea. Although I have to admit, I'm, I'm a huge black tea drinker. So I don't drink as much herbal tea as like maybe I should. Uh, but, you know, I use a lot of herbs in, in cooking and, you know, you're just talking about like the digestive quality. Sometimes after dinner, I just go out to the garden and I, I nibble, you know, <laughs> as, as that digestive. Um, I remember a friend who lived in France talking about how like her family would just like do that, like just go out to the garden and stand in the garden and nibble. Hmm. And it was just such a beautiful image. And so I, I've really tried to incorporate that into my daily life, just that like, oh, I need a little bit of this. I'm just going to run out and grab it. Um, instead of the herbs being kind of like precious and set aside for, 
for medicine. Mm-hmm. I'm more looking for the the daily connection. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the scent, the tactile quality, the the reminder that I am a part of this larger ecosystem and community. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that so much, Maya. Again, very similar paths uh, on that, including the black tea. <laughs> um, <laughs> One thing that I did not know before I grew sage in my own garden was how incredibly beautiful it is. I mean, before I grew it, I was kind of familiar with it cut and dried. Those whole leaves are so beautiful. You know, they come in all different, you know, you can buy all different kinds of hybrids, but that that silvery green is just in itself. The uh, salvia officinalis is so beautiful. But then it's the flowers that kind of blew my mind. I had no idea. So when those flower, they're so prolific with all of the that wand of purple sage flowers. It's just so intensely beautiful. I just had no idea. You know, it was like, that was one of the biggest surprises of growing herbs, actually. I can imagine your garden is just filled with purple flowers at some point. It's full with purple flowers because a lot of the allium have purple flowers as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the thing that surprised me about sage is how large it grows. Mm, yes, yes. It's yes. really big. Mm-hmm. And um, my sage usually keeps going straight through the winter, hmm. um, which is also really fun. Like when the rest of the garden is dead, I go out and there's sage, which makes me wonder if like that's part of the association with like wisdom, you know, mm-hmm. because winter is often associated with like the elders um, and their sage, like still beautiful and silver and going strong straight straight through the winter. Um, I, I always notice because like Thanksgiving, when I go to grab herbs from the garden for whatever I'm cooking, everything else is miserable. And there's the sage. <laughs> you know? That's funny. That, so I'm in zone four, so not in the, you know, temperate rainforest. And we often have snow on the ground by the time Thanksgiving is. But I know that there's usually not too much snow. And I know I can go out there and dust off the snow and get my fresh sage. We usually stuff the turkey with sage as well as, you know, do all the stuffings and everything. So it's sage heavy our Thanksgiving is. So that's funny that we both have that same experience, but different. But even under the snow, I can just brush off the snow and there's great looking sage under there. Yeah. Not many plants you can do that with. No, not many plants you can do that with at all. Um, so yeah, it's it's a really interesting one. I think I learned that it was incredibly drying like super astringent. And I think that that's part of why I avoided it for a long time. Like I was just concerned about like it's extra, you know, it's kind of extra action. Um, but I I don't find in cooking with it that it has that ridiculous potency. You, you know, in tincture, yes. But um, in culinary form, I, I think it's lovely. I mean, you know, if you're super vata, like super, super dry in your constitution, it might not be a good choice for you. But um, I think for the rest of us, it's it's really a, a lovely herb. And, you know, it's an aromatic, so it's going to be antimicrobial, antiviral, anti, anti, anti. Um, <laughs> sometimes I will mix it with honey just to kind of counterbalance some of the some of the super dry. This is like this is one of those I don't often I don't often like to talk about ingesting essential oils because I feel like Americans are so bad at subtlety. <laughs> and like, you know, with the essential oils that you can ingest, you need to be ingesting them in at such low levels. Um so if you can if you can be a subtle person, I'm going to tell you something. If you can't, like fast forward 10 seconds so you don't screw yourself up. <laughs> if you can be a subtle person, take like a quarter cup of honey and put one drop, one drop, no more sage essential oil. Make sure that it's organic so that you're not like getting crap. Um and you mix it in with the honey and then put that into a cup of tea. This is great mm-hmm. for like a sore throat. You know, those like yeah. really painful sore throats, like the strep sore throat. So good. Um, but it is so easy to overdo it. And it's like, it's not good for you. It is not good for your liver. So mm-hmm. 
when I say one drop, like I mean one drop. And if two drops go in, then you got to add more honey to dilute it further. Yeah. Um, also, sage essential oil is not good if you have seizures. This yeah. is one to avoid if you have seizures. Uh, but it's, you know, the essential oil form is is very grounding. Like sometimes if I'm feeling really out in, out in space, I'll just put a drop of sage essential oil on the bottom of my feet. Hmm. Um, and the other thing that I've used it for, well, there's two other things that I've used it for that are kind of fun and interesting. Um, I'll put fresh sage leaves in a bucket of super hot water if I have a migraine. And then I put my feet in the in the bucket of super hot water. Oh, um, yeah, it's, you know, the, the hot water is going to dilate the blood vessels of your feet, right? So it's going to change the blood flow in your body, which can really help with a migraine. I would say it works 60% of the time. Hmm. It's not, a, you know, if I had the 100% cure-all for a migraine, I'd be rich. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you need the water super, super hot. The sage is not necessary, but but when I get migraines, I get like shakes with them. And that the sage just helps with that like grounding, like that just you know, getting getting your energy down when um it's getting very frantic. Um, and then the other thing I love it for is mixed with apple cider vinegar and you let it like sit as if it were like a tincture, and then that's a great hair rinse, especially mm. if you have dark hair. It'll, it'll add a little depth and shine. Do you dilute that when you use it or do you just use it straight apple cider vinegar? Put in a So I make straight apple cider vinegar with the sage. And then like the way that I use it is usually standing in the shower. I pour it over my head. So it's kind of getting shower water. And you know what I mean? Like I don't put it in. I, I know people who put it in and let it sit. I don't have that kind of patience. <laughs> like a pour over and like the shower water's happening and stuff. Um, I would say if you're, if you want to like put it in and let it sit, I would, I would dilute it. Mm, nice. Yeah. Those are really, uh, all those sound like so much fun. Um, I haven't done essential oil and honey, but there, I don't think a year goes by that I don't make sage uh, leaf and flower infused honey, just the whole herb. And that's one of my favorite things. And like you said, it's incredible for a sore throat. And with that, you, know, you take it by the spoonful or I put it in my honey or in my teas a lot. So I just kind of go through it through the year, either out of enjoyment or for a sore throat, depending on what the needs are. <laughs> but yeah, I just don't go a year without making it. It's one of my favorites. And um, I, that's so cool about the herbal baths because I feel like herbal foot baths are just underrated. So thank you for that too. Oh yeah. I love a good herbal foot bath. I love like, I love those little things that um, people, people kind of forget to do that are such a treat. Mm. Like, like I love putting honey on my face mm. and putting some herbs in a bowl of water, pouring hot water over the herbs. And then, you know, the honey's on your face. You have all the aromatic herbs in your bowl and you take a towel and you go under and you steam off the honey and it like drips down your face and drips into the bowl. That would be great with your sage honey. Oh, nice. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's lovely. I've never done that as like a, I've only done that kind of thing as like a, I have congestion in my sinuses and lungs kind of thing, but never as like a self-care, but I'm sure it's lovely. The pore cleaner. It's so good for your skin. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Well, is there anything else that you would like to add about sage? I feel like we've covered so many bases here. <laughs> no, I mean, I feel like that's, that's a really good beginning. Although I want your particular recipe for sage honey. Yeah. Well, so simple. Just chop those babies up for, I like it fresh, you know, so fresh sage leaves and it could just be the leaves, but it's fun to add the flowers too. Just if that happens to be going on and yeah, put those up, fill a jar gently and then add the honey that's been, you know, liquid honey and give it a good stir. Let it sit for a bit. Yeah. So do you put like, you know, I, I, whenever I do honeys, I always try to find somewhere warm to put them. I used to have a house with radiators and I would mm. put them like, like the jar in a water bath on the radiator. Mm -hmm. But That's nice, yeah. that do you, yeah. do you, I just do put it on the counter. Yeah. yeah. And it, the, the honey is so cool because it's that hydroscopic or I forget the name for it, but it, you know, pulls out the water 
And yeah. so, it, and then with the aromatics, I just think it like pulls it all out really bit. And you can just, I always leave the sage in there. I never strain it again because I can't be bothered with that. Um, I'll say woman after my own. <laughs> um, but you know, the longer you leave them in, it's like, they just get dry and crispy in there. But what I do is I just put them in, you know, with my tea when I'm infusing it or even just to eat it, it's fine. And, um, but yeah, they, I think it pulls it out just fine. Nice. Yeah. Well, Maya, for people who don't know you, I feel like we should talk about these herbal things you do because people might not know about herbiary and uh, they might not know about your other books, which I adore as well. And I think you have a new journal out too. So let's, <laughs> I just said them all, but let's go for it. Tell us about herbiary. Okay. So um, when I came back from studying in Ireland, I opened a store called Herbiary. It started in Philadelphia. We still have a store there. And then I moved down to, Phil uh, to Asheville, North Carolina, and we have a store here and we're online. So um, yeah, we carry, you know, medicinals and sometimes we joke and call it the soapiary because there's always fabulous local soap makers and we can't help ourselves. And so, you know, we buy all the, the natural soaps made with essential oils and we have zillions of them, um, natural skincare products, essential oils. We, we try really hard to have a good variety for people who are using herbs as medicine. And then also like the things like soap that we call gateway drugs, um, <laughs> <laughs> get people into, um, using more natural skincare products and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's the stores. And then, I have to say, I love Herbiary online. I hope one day I can visit. I've long wanted to go. Um, you are so, so welcome here. You come visit. It's just, it's just kind of, you know, a couple states away from me, um, like all of them. So <laughs> I, it's a little bit far, but I hope to go one day. Well, I would love to have you. So come visit. Um, the books. Yeah, I write a lot of books because I made the mistake of like looking up, you know, the, the big guys like Stephen King and stuff. I'm like, how many books do they do every year? I'm like, oh, I have to do a book a year, which is crazy, people. It's crazy. <laughs> I'm going to slow down. But I've been doing a book a year for a while. So the, uh, the first set is based on the ancient medicine kingdoms. If you study Taoist medicine, there are three ancient kingdoms, animal, vegetable, mineral. So we have the herbiary, the bestiary, and the crystallary. And, um, you know, they're all based on the, the actual, like, characteristics and properties of um, the herbs, the, the animals, and the crystals. And the crystals are, are really interesting because in Taoist medicine, um, crystals were put in water and then the water was sipped. And, you know, that sounds crazy pants on the surface, but if you take supplements, if you take iron, if you take magnesium, if you take calcium, um, we now do this with pills, but they didn't have pills at that point. So they were putting the stone that had the iron, like hematite in a cup, letting the, you know, stuff get into the water and drinking it. You don't really want to do this because stones are often like many different things. If you know you have a pure stone, that's one thing. But a lot of times, like, it might be hematite and also asbestos or whatever, which you don't want to drink. Right. Um, thus, some problems <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with the ancient medicine. But um, really fascinating how for thousands of years, people have understood the, the property of different minerals and, um, you know, used it in their medicine. So... That was the first grouping. And then Before I Before you go into the fourth book, I just yeah. want to interrupt. So I remember when the Herbary was published, the book, and um, I was excited for it. The illustrations are stunning. So like the preliminary artwork and stuff was fun to see. And my thought, I remember is being like, oh, this is going to be like a fun, cutesy book about herbs with like a little, <laughs> little tidbits here and there. And I remember being absolutely floored at the wisdom that you've captured in that book. And then I remember, um, you know, the next one came out about animals and I was kind of like, oh, we'll see. Yeah, I'm kind of an herbalist, you know, <laughs> well, like, a little biased towards the plants. We'll see. And that one also is just the, again, the wisdom that you've captured through these animals. And um, so, yeah, those are 
just a phenomenal set of books. The cards are so much fun. And of course, the illustrations are so stunning, but it's really just a surprise. Like it was surprising to me uh, now having known you for a while and knowing just what an incredible and insightful writer you are and thinker. It's not surprising, but you know, th that was back in the beginning. So, well, and I, you know, I'm also like, I'm kind of ridiculously serious. So, you know, like I was even annoyed at how cutesy the illustrations were. Like my, <laughs> my publisher, you know, was in charge of that and I wasn't. And I was like, right. you know, I remember when I saw the cover of the illustrated herbiary, it was like, it looks like the farmer's almanac. And, <laughs> uh, and my editor's like, like, great. I'm like, no, not great. You know? <laughs> I was kind of going for it. Like I want white and crisp and like tone poems to the plants, um, which luckily my editor was smarter than I was and, and realized what people would, would want and what would hold their, their attention. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been an interesting journey for me because like, I, like even using the word magic, I am a person who, um, has way too many academic credits. Like I just, I have always had an academic curiosity and just like always wanted to know and I want to know why and I want it proven. Um, so like that was, that was a lot of the hurdle when I went to Ireland was that um, I was kind of so rigidly intellectual and like my teacher really felt like she had to shake that out of me. Hmm. Um you know, and like a lot of letting magic in is like, thus the title, like going from this person who was very rational and very rigid in her rationality to, um, you know, trying to, to let this sense of wonder and enchantment into my own life. I always read it in books, like, but it was this thing I escaped to because I didn't think it could infuse my own life. It was separate. It was in a book. Um, and so like learning how to pull it into my own life was magical. Hmm. I think that's a perfect segue into the fourth book in the series, which is a book that was, um, again, meant a lot to me. And I didn't even know that that series could get any better. And yeah. So what? Yeah, tell us about the fourth book, kind of the capstone. Okay, so the fourth book, um, I named the Wild Wisdom Almanac, but it got renamed the Wild Wisdom Companion. Don't ask. Um, it is a wheel of the year book. It's about how to take the three medicine kingdoms, animal, vegetable, mineral, and incorporate incorporate them into your life uh, around the wheel of the year. It's kind of like you know how do you how do you make friends with all this stuff and and use it. People who uh, have read the series, like so many people, it is their favorite of the series. I hear this over and over. It's fascinating. And I blame the name. It is like the, the least seller. You know, when I look at the stats, it's, oh, it's, like the, it's like the baby book. But so many people who are like deeply into this, um, this world, this, you know, herbalism and, and uh, slow living and finding ways to live with nature, like it's their favorite book. So definitely. <laughs> Um, and then from there, I wrote a book called The Night School, which I've been dabbling in mysticism. I, I studied philosophy in, in college. And so like philosophy and mysticism, especially if you go back to the ancient Greeks and Romans are, are pretty close to each other. Um, and I've always been curious about how like ancient mysticism and philosophy has fed our current thoughts about um, spirituality. And so that plus, I kept saying to myself, what would you learn if you actually went to Hogwarts? <laughs> so those two questions informed the night school. Um, a lot of books about mysticism are really, really dry and really, really hard to read. So I wanted to create something that was fun and that was engaging um, and that kind of gave a primer for like 
different forms of mystical study and how we use them today and like what the what the roots are because i think i feel like so often people get books that have like a spell in it and they just do this thing without any understanding of where that thing came from or why it might work and i feel like once you understand the building blocks of mysticism then you can create your own magic like you can kind of understand um the reasons behind something you know instead of just reading someone else's words and being like okay now i have to take rose petals and sprinkle them counterclockwise and say these words and i'm always like yuck don't tell me what to think and to say um instead i want to know why rose petals why clockwise and what are these words and then i can kind of go oh okay for me i'm going to use carnation and not rose and um you know who cares about the counterclockwise and those words don't make any sense to me at all I'm making up my own mm -hmm. right so like once you have you understand like the why you can um create ceremonies and rituals and moments that are meaningful to you that like going back to the idea of connection the point is to connect mm -hmm. so you need to find the symbols the scents the plants that tap into your own subconscious because what you're you know what you're doing with any kind of a ritual is talking to yourself really <laughs> you're kind of reinforcing this is what matters to me i feel strongly about this i'm putting my energy towards this i'm putting my intention toward this and so you want to use the symbols that are meaningful to you in doing that and like for some people that um might be like religious symbolism right like you know if you're a person who is of a particular faith then you have symbols and language from that faith and you can take that and use it to reinforce um your own your own thinking it's kind of like a like a like a mantra right like like you know spells are not so mysterious as a spell is really just kind of saying to the universe this thing is important to me. I'm going to put my energy toward this particular thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that that works best because what we're trying to do is bolster ourselves when we use the symbols that speak to us personally. Mm. I love that. Yeah, I really resonate with that a lot. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so the night school is, is really to help people to like understand those foundations and fundamentals so that um, it becomes very easy to, to make your own magic, to make magic that makes sense in your life and your worldview. Yeah, it's a very um, insightful book. I love the beginning and the um, invitation to, you know, wait till it's nighttime before you <laughs> dig in. Yeah, it has a very, um, particular like feel to it. It's not, I don't think it'd be easy to feel like neutral about that book. You know, it's like, it just, it evokes a lot of feeling within it. Um, I, I really wanted to come up with a metaphor for that kind of like soft, misty sideways way of thinking. And so for me, like the night became the metaphor for like when your defenses go down, when you put your rational brain aside, like you're done with your work for the day, it doesn't have to be this kind of like perfect rational world. You know, everything's a little soft and misty and fuzzy and different things seem possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you brought up the Hogwarts reference, so I'm not going to hold back anymore. When you've been talking about letting magic in, it made me think of, like, in my mind, I was like, oh, it's like the journey from Muggle to, you know, whatever we end up at the other end of that. <laughs> but that's how I was That is so about. funny. It's the journey from Muggle to Wizard. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it it is. Like, I feel like it's, it is that kind of real world transformation. Um you know, and it's not external stuff. It's it's internal stuff. It's how you choose to see the world, how you choose to interpret um, the the information coming in. Because we we always have a choice. You know, yeah. how we choose to think about things is is a choice, and um, you have to kind of train your brain your brain sometimes to think differently. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, gosh, Maya, thank you so much for just all the work that you put out into this world and uh, all the ways that you show us magic and ways to let it in. And at the end here of the interview, I love to ask uh, everyone a question and you and I chatted and you were so excited to talk about what's in your first aid kit. And so we're breaking tradition a little bit here to go back to a season nine question, but I'm in charge, so it's totally allowed. <laughs> and so, yeah, what is in your first aid kit? Yeah. So, you know, Herbal I first aid kit. that's an obvious Herbal first aid kit. If you say Neosporin, it's just like loses a bit of magic. I have to say. <laughs> There's no Neosporin. Totally allowed. Totally allowed. I don't but... have Neosporin in the house. Um, okay. So the thing that we use the most in my house is bentonite clay. Hmm. We use so much clay in this house. It's crazy. Um, so for those of you who don't know what it is, bentonite clay is uh, like a high mineral clay and it comes powdered. You can add water to it. After you add water, you can put essential oils in. Sometimes I'll like mash up plantain and mix that with the, the bentonite clay. And like we use it for everything. We use it to dry poison ivy. We I've seen it. it for that. It's amazing. Yeah. I mixed it with hydrosol from that. It makes such an interesting um, substance. But yeah, it was just, oh, it was so effective. We don't have a ton of that here, but a uh, four-year-old got into it and it was horrible and it was just amazing for her. So anyway, continue. I was excited. Yeah. Sometimes like mix it with like apple cider vinegar mm -hmm. and that for poison ivy. So Bentonite clay is like on the counter. We have like a little jar of it on the counter in the house. Um, we put it on mosquito bites. I mean, it's really, it's very drawing. It pulls things out, bee stings. It'll pull the, the stinger out. Um, so it's super useful. Um, I have about 17 forms of Arnica. <laughs> so, you know, I have homeopathic pellets. I have oil that you can rub on. I have... I have tincture, which is like, that's another super low dose. Like that's like one drop in a big glass of water. Um, and interestingly, you know, comfrey is kind of the um, East Coast version of Arnica. Arnica is more of a, a West Coast plant. So um, when I have comfrey in the garden, I'll, I'll use fresh comfrey instead of Arnica. But Arnica for all your bumps, bruises, scrapes. Um, actually, take that back. Not scrapes. You really don't want to put it on broken skin. Um, but your bumps and your bruises, that's that's Arnica. Um, have a basic heal all salve. So that's like your plantain comfrey. I think there's some jewel weed in the one we usually have. Because I have the store, you know, it's like we're always trying different things. Um mm -hmm just different, different brands and different people's products, but, uh, it's got to have comfrey. It's got to have plantain. The other ingredients tend to shift a little bit. Um, Agreed. yeah. Yeah. And then lavender essential oil is like, it is an entire pharmacy in one bottle. Um, it's amazing for any kind of burn like sunburns, um, all the way to, you know, second degree burns, um, with really, with really bad burns, you do lavender oil, cool water, lavender oil, cool water, and you keep alternating. And I have watched like things that are screaming and starting to blister, just slowly cool down <laughs> and like the skin returns to normal. It's <laughs> crazy. It's crazy. Um, you want Lavender and Gustafolia for that. Um, some of the other varieties work, but not as well. And you really want to make sure that you have essential oil and not fragrance oil. Fragrance yeah. oil does not do diddly squat. <laughs> uh, it's not from plants. Yeah. So, you know, if it doesn't have a Latin name on it, it's not an essential oil. Mm -hmm. um, so those are my big ones. Then my other kind of like strange thing, especially for travel, um, I use an herbal deodorant that's like lavender, thyme, and vetiver. Hmm. And so when I'm traveling, I have this essential oil blend that's lavender, thyme, and vetiver that's always with me. Um, and, you know, 
thyme is antimicrobial and antiviral. Um, Lavender is also antiseptic. Vetiver is very grounding. Um, vetiver is also kind of like thick and sticky. So it, it has a little bit of that, um, like holds thing to get, holds things together. So I use that on everything when I'm traveling. Like if I think I'm getting sick, I roll some on my hands and put my hands over my nose and smell. Um, if I get a little cut, I just roll it on. Uh, so that, that. So these are diluted in oil then I'm assuming. Or they're, they're actually they're neat because there's enough okay, lavender in roller. In there that lavender becomes the base. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that underarm deodorant roller like is used for everything when I travel. It's the thing. Wow. These are awesome first aid tips. <laughs> I can see why you're excited to share them. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I travel quite a bit, like, especially with like book, book stuff. Um, and you want something that like gets super small that you can put in your little clear plastic mm -hmm. show to the airport people pouch. Um, so yeah, I've, I've dialed it down at this point. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much for sharing those. And thanks for coming back on the show, sharing so much wisdom. Um, so many things about Sage that are just fantastic. Yeah, I'm just so pleased to have you here. I am so thrilled to be here. Thank you so much, Rosalie. Thank you, Maya. Thanks for being here. Don't forget to head over to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com to download your beautifully illustrated recipe card and get a transcript of this show. There, you'll also be able to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is the best way to stay in touch with me. You can also visit Maya directly at mayatoll.com. If you'd like more herbal episodes to come your way, then one of the best ways to support this podcast is by subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks, and I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Also, a big round of thanks to the people all over the world who make this podcast happen week to week. Nicole Paul is the project manager who oversees the whole operation from guest outreach to writing show notes to actually uploading each episode and so many other things I don't even know. She really holds this whole thing together. Francesca is our fabulous video and audio editor. She not only makes listening more pleasant, she also adds beauty to the YouTube videos with plant images and video overlays. Tatiana Rusikova is the botanical illustrator who creates gorgeous plant and recipe illustrations for us. I love them. I know that you do too. Christy edits the recipe cards and then Jenny creates them as well as the thumbnail images for YouTube. Michelle is the tech wizard behind the scenes and Karen is our student services coordinator and customer support. For those of you who like to read along, Jennifer is who creates the transcripts each week. Xavier, my handsome French husband, is the cameraman and website IT guy. It takes an herbal village to make it all happen, including you. One of the best ways to retain and fully understand something you've just learned is to share it in your own words. With that in mind, I invite you to share your takeaways with me and the entire Herbs with Rosalie community. You can leave comments on my YouTube channel, on the Herbs with Rosalie podcast.com show notes page, or simply hit reply to my Wednesday email. I read every comment that comes in, and I'm excited to hear your herbal thoughts on Sage. Okay, you've lasted to the very end of the show, which means you get a gold star and this herbal tidbit. Well, I had to do a bit of searching for this episode's herbal tidbit because Maya already shared so many interesting things about Sage. I also have a solo podcast about Sage where I've shared a lot there as well. So what I did is I checked in on recent research and found this observational study from March, 2023. In this study, 74 patients aged 13 to 69 were given echinacea and sage lozenges for an acute sore throat. The herbs were well tolerated with no complications. So the cool thing about this study is that they not only took subjective feedback to see that the lozenges reduced throat pain by 48%, but they also saw that the viral loads in those taking the lozenges were reduced by 62% after taking a single lozenge. The researchers concluded, Echinacea salvia lozenges represent a valuable and safe option for the early treatment of acute sore throats capable to alleviate symptoms and contribute to reducing viral loads in the throat. 
So go Sage and go Echinacea. <laughs>